a few days ago, a friend told me about this uh, 12 and 23 challenge uh, that started on exorcism.org. And I thought it would be fun to try and do some exercises on, um, on a few of these languages. And today, so I've gone through a few. I've done um, a few exercises for Scala, Python, Ruby and Crystal, which are languages that I've been working on more or less over the last few years. And I thought now we get into the more esoteric languages. Um, it's hard to pick ones that I already know very well. So I thought it might be fun to just see how it goes and learn uh, to there, together with you. If you want to uh, just walk through this experience with me. Uh, and in case you're not familiar with the platform, exorcism.org is a um, web application where you can browse through a large number of uh, uh, programming languages and just pick whichever you want to learn and do a few exercises. And for many of them, there's also some tutorials attached to exercises. So it's quite um, nice and the other nice thing is in order to try a programming language you don't need to install anything on your machine although you can and you're invited to do that because you get a shorter feedback loop if you do you can just try things out in some online web-based editor and that's convenient i'd say so the idea with this 12 in 23 challenge is that one would go through at least five exercises for 12 different languages over the over the next 12 months and of course the idea is to just spend or dedicate say a month on each one um, and what I'm doing here is not exactly the way the challenge is intended to work which is just get a few done as quickly as possible but anyway we all entertain ourselves in different ways and that's my way of doing that so as you can see, there's a bunch of different tracks, Ruby, Python, Scala, and then there's really a lot of stuff here. Uh, you might find your favorite language or maybe one that you've wanted to learn for a long time. Uh, either way, this is a good place to start. And so far, from, from what I've seen, um, you start from very basic exercises. The emphasis is not on algorithms, but rather on language constructs and um, you know just learning how to browse the documentation for a language for a start is uh, is a good enough um, first step into it i'd say so and you will notice that depending on the language you have a varying number of exercises and also a varying number of concepts and what i think is the case is the more concepts you find the more tutorials you're gonna go through and i think when you see a large number of concepts it means someone has put a lot of attention and effort in uh, um, defining some sort of um, uh, journey into learning the language when you don't see too many concepts it means that that attention has not been put there yet uh, maybe the language is fairly new maybe there's not too many people following it or using it yet and the other aspect is you might see that some exercises uh, some, some languages are just a hand, have just a handful of exercises and some have hundreds and I have to say we are lucky today because we're going to be doing some elixir and as you can see we have plenty of exercises and plenty of concepts to learn and it all starts with the usual hello word so we'll try and go through this uh, together mm, elixir is um, a slightly different language that you might be used to. Well, let's let's just go dive straight into it. Classic introductory exercise. Just say hello world. We'll just have to modify some code. Run the test suite that that is provided, which is exercise with each exercise, and then submit the solution. Okay, so let's just go. And as I mentioned, we're just going to do this on the web interface, but one could download the exorcism executable and then 
uh, use that to actually have a bit of a faster feedback loop. And the first thing that gets my attention is the fact that I've got some sort of module defined here. So that's not what you find with all the languages and the definition is given by this def module and then the name of the module and then the block is encapsulated in a do end um, set of keywords. Um, that might remind you somewhat of uh, Ruby, although you wouldn't do that. In Ruby you would just say module then the name of the module and then just end it somewhere. Here you have the do as an opening uh, keyword which is interesting. I can also see there's something about the um, way of doing way of documenting the uh, the method here so we, we're defining a module called hello world we're defining a, a function on the module called hello and we are defining we are we are adding a couple of annotation to it one is about documenting the the function easy enough and the other one we might want to spend a bit of time getting familiar with i think this has to do with the types that go in and out of the of the function in this case there's no argument so there's no type for the arguments and then there's an annotation for the type of the return value which is in this in this case a string so i'm just inferring from the context the fact that this dot t uh, identifies the type associated to uh, to a string uh, things should be easy enough at this point. Um, we just need to change this string so that it matches the output we're looking for, which is really well. You can also check out on Exorcism, you can see there's a set of instructions. That was loud. So there's a set of instructions, then there's a page for tests, uh, which you can check out, and they're usually something you can look at openly. Some languages actually have uh, locked tests that you can look inspect directly which is not great uh, but that's just different different styles and then you will see test results on this uh, tab and as you can see the test is fairly straightforward but again it tells us something about how you write tests in the language which is handy so we do def modules or we're going to define a module for the test and the convention seems to be that you just um, append test to the name of the module you're testing and then you're importing some sort of package in this case with this use keyword uh, x unit case or at least it feels like you're importing stuff maybe you're not exactly importing maybe in the context of tests uh, you already have this uh, x unit module available and you're just uh, using some sort of uh, interface we'll check that out later and then the test is easy enough we open with test describe the test and then wrap the body of the test in a do end block and in this case we are calling the hello uh, function on hello world as a module and then just checking that it matches the expectation so that should be it so if i just run the test here we are good uh, the ui informs us that the test has passed so we're okay to submit the solution we can go ahead and the final thing we need to do on exorcism you can see that there's a, a spot here where um, the system will tell us if there's any way of improving our, our solution um, uh, and interestingly some tutors or people that have gone through this exercise before us will let us know if there's any way of improving the solution this one is interesting and it's um, showing as a p possible shorthand for uh, a method of a si on a single line which is to just go for do colon and then uh, the body of the uh, of the function and in this case uh, we don't even have to express the fact that the block is ending and that's just a useful shorthand for a very short function so let's keep that in mind maybe we can test this out later okay we can mark the exercise as complete we don't want to share it with anyone this is simple enough and we can go back to show me concepts and as you can see there's a bunch of concepts some of them most of them are actually locked until we perform we complete some exercises and so we're gonna have to start with the basics if I go to the exercises view you can see there's only one exercise available so that's <laughs> we're sort of stuck with that so I'll click on basics let's go by concepts 
and I can see that this module is about this exercise is about variables and modules and just giving us a bit of a, uh, an introduction on how to define variables which should be simple enough and uh, I just noticed that there's no semicolon or anything like that and we're not defining the type of um, the object referenced by the variable which is also interesting and then we've talked about defining modules already so that's uh, easy we also defined some functions um, with the hello function but here we can see what it looks like when we're defining a function with some uh, arguments so this is also useful um, this is something I remember from the last time I looked at the language so defp is a way of um, defining private, private functions so let's keep that in mind as well uh, not too relevant in exorcism while doing exercise here, exercises here but definitely if you're writing production code or you want to keep your code tidy it makes sense to think whether uh, a method or a function should be uh, better a function should be private or, or public uh, in a module mm, what else Okay, this is useful when invoking a function inside the same module where it's defined, then the name of the module can be omitted. Otherwise, uh, you have to access the function with a dot, which makes sense. And we've looked at the shorthand to define, ooh, to define functions on a single line. Uh, just uh, a big highlight on this comma here which one is probably going to forget a few times before getting the fact that it goes there and this example also shows us that if we try to invoke a function that is private then we get an undefined function error as it should be okay we also talk about the arity of functions so the numbers of expected arguments that are supposed to be provided to the function when invoking it and uh, this is particularly important in um, elixirs as i understand it because um, we can overload functions based on the number of arguments not based on the num on the type of t on the type of the arguments and that 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 means that when we are defining for example a um, the documentation for a method uh, for a function we want to make sure that we are uh, documenting a specific well a function with a specific arity so with a specific number of arguments because other might have slightly different ways of working we then have some information about the standard library which we can skip for now and are reminded that comments start with the um, hash sign good to know okay I think we're ready to make some lasagna so I'm gonna go in What's the GCR? Uh, I think I've done this exercise in other for other languages. So the idea here is we have to define a function returning the number of expected minutes a lasagna should stay in the oven, and this is defined as 40 in this case. And then we need to define how many a function that returns the number of minutes that are remaining for our lasagna to stay in the oven based on the number of minutes that the lasagna has already been in the oven. That's remaining minutes in oven and uh, we need to also uh, help our cook that uh, figure out how much time it's going to take to prepare the lasagna based on the number of layers considering that every layer will take two minutes to prepare so this is a basic multiplication but again um, this is supposed to be straightforward and then we'll calculate the total working time in minutes so how much time we've spent working on the lasagna considering the number of layers and how many minutes the lasagna has been in the oven already finally this is new compared to other um, uh, languages uh, create a notification that the lasagna is ready it's going to be a method with a function with no arguments um, and returns a message indicating that the lasagna is ready to eat straightforward enough just returning a string okay can start in editor and define mm -mm, all these functions and as you can see we have an introduction here uh, most of this stuff we've looked at already in the previous page we can see 
have a look at the results. We can't see the tests here, which is okay. Um, so let's see. Let's see if we can just, for a start, try and um, define expected minutes in oven. And this is a function that takes no argument, as you can see from the slash zero, which specifies the arity, which again is going to be important later for. Uh, times when we want to overload the function and uh, I also remind myself that I need to open with do um, and we want to return 40 as the number of minutes that we need to wait uh, for uh, lasagna to be ready I don't think we need to um, be explicit about returning values so that's okay and I've not seen ways of defining constants within the module, so let's do this. Let's try and run the tests. And I'm expecting that we'll pass at least one. And as you can see, we've passed task one, which is to define the expected minutes in oven. So that was easy enough. We can also check if we're able to define a constant of sort within the module. So I can do Try and do this the same way I do it in Ruby and see if that actually works. So this would be something like minutes in an oven or something equals 40. And then I'm thinking, can I just access this from inside the method and then run test? I cannot, no match of right hand side value 40. Hmm. Uh, okay, I might need to use some other sort of syntax for this. We can say module constants elixir. Oh, module attributes in this case. Okay. Not, I don't think we want to set it as annotation. As constants. Okay. Um, okay, I think this is what we're looking for, possibly. So just starting with at and then the name of the of the constant, and then we want to define it with just the space. Okay, so like my data fourteen. Okay, fine. Not what we're used to, probably, but fair enough. So this would look like. And then we go snake case something like this, starting with an app. Try and return this. Let's see if this works. Nice. Okay, moving on. We now want to, and let me also delete this line. There's no need for these docs. Define remaining minutes in oven. This takes one argument. So we're gonna do so they're gonna give us a number which is the number of minutes the lasagna has already been in the oven. And we can call it last time and then always do and then end and we'll think about going to short end uh, um, notation later and what we're doing here we're just we're just doing minutes you know when minus the elapsed time and i guess we might just want to reuse the previous method but for the time being let's just go this approach and see if we're doing okay okay so this is fine moving on preparation time in minutes so and looking at this you can see what sort of tests we're doing here um, even though we don't have direct access to the tests the source code for the test we can see what they were about and elixir is very good at giving us as much context as possible when tests fail so that's that should be enough so in this case we're doing 
that um, preparation time in minutes we are passing the number of layers and then and then we're just multiplying by two now two is another one of those constants so we can call it something like minutes per layer and say it's two so that we can change our mind later um, and then just multiply by the number of the layers and we should be okay moving on calculating the total working time in minutes okay This time we have how many arguments? So this is two arguments, RIT2, and what we have here is the number of layers and the number of minutes. The lasagna has been in the, in the oven already. And then I can end here. And so we can probably reuse some of the functions we've already, we've already defined. Uh, so we can do preparation time in minutes on the layers and then add the elapsed time that should tell us how, how long we've been working on the on the lasagna and finally and this should be just a um, formality in the fight alarm which should return just a string and great opportunity to use the one line notation uh, shorthand where we just go for comma and then do if I'm not mistaken um, let me also remove this comment and try again let's try here we go okay we can now submit the exercise so what we've learned so far is mostly around how we can define data constants within the module which was useful so moving on uh, there's uh, some recommendation from the bot about the fact that remaining minutes in oven could reuse expected minutes in oven which is a fair point that's something we were uh, considering when defining this so we could just use this function within remaining minutes in oven which doesn't have to rely on a specific um, specific field uh, inter internal field of the of the module Fair enough, we're going to mark this as complete anyway, we're not going to share it with anyone because it's, it's, it's a trivial enough and go back to concepts and see if we can do another one. So we've um, unlocked a few a few concepts. We can get into anonymous functions, which I know is one of the most exciting features of uh, Elixir. Um, okay, functions are treated as first class citizens in Elixir. This means that named and anonymous functions can be assigned to variables, okay? Same way you would do with a Ruby Lambda or a Python Lambda function. Named and anonymous, anonymous functions can be passed around like data as arguments and return values. This is very, very handy. Um, and again, it's something you've probably seen done in both Python and Ruby, although the way you do that is slightly different. Uh, anonymous functions can be created dynamically. Oh, that's also quite cool. Um, let's see what that means in practice, okay? In contrast to named functions, they don't have a static reference available to them. Okay, they are only available if they are assigned to a variable or invoked immediately, otherwise they're lost. We might use anonymous functions to hide data using lexical scope, uh, meaning uh, using a closure or dynamically creating functions at runtime. Okay, uh, looking at the lexical scope, uh, you can think of this as you're within the body of a function and you define a, an anonymous function which uses the value of a variable that is local to the uh, function where you define uh, the anonymous function 
and then you can pass around this anonymous function, maybe return it from the from the caller, um, and the receiver of the anonymous function doesn't have to know, doesn't need to know about the uh, variables that have been encapsulated and closed into uh, the anonymous function, mm, which is a, an interesting use. Um, creating functions at runtime dynamically is also interesting. Let's see how we can do that. Okay, they start defining an anonymous function starts with fn, and then we have the set of parameters and then arrow and the definition. As you can see, there's no do keyword here. We just go function parameters arrow body of the function and then end, which is to be reminded. And the last expression is implicitly returned. So last statement you have is the value that is going to be returned to the calling function. Oh, okay. This is also interesting. And if you are familiar with anonymous functions in, in Ruby, you know that um, they take a similar approach to calling them. So you can either dot call the, the anonymous function or you can dot and then uh, pass the arguments in parentheses. So this might look a bit weird at first, but again, it's a great way of figuring out whether we're looking at a function or an anonymous function being invoked here. There's also a nice shorthand. Well, I don't know if it's nice. It's a shorthand notation um, to make the definition of uh, uh, anonymous functions more concise. Uh, when you see ampersand one, you have to think about the first argument. Uh, so this is a function, an anonymous function that adds one to whatever the argument passed in was. And the short end starts with an ampersand. So you're going to have one ampersand to open, then parenthesis, and then one ampersand uh, prepending any arguments you might have, uh, you might want to have. Okay, let's see if we can play a bit with this. Let me know how this looks so far it's completely foreign or reminds you of something you've seen before. Okay, we are tasked with writing the software for an encryption device. Great. That works by performing transformation on data, our specialty. You need a way to flexibly create complicated functions by combining simpler functions together. What is usually talked about as higher order functions, so functions that return other functions that can be combined, combined with other functions. For each task, return an anonymous function that can be invoked invoked from the calling scope. Okay. All functions should expect integer arguments. Okay. Integers are also suitable for performing bitwise operations in Elixir, which we might want to look up uh, when needed. Okay. We can go from the top looking at each task. And the first one is to create a secret add function, which returns a function which takes one argument and adds to it the argument passed passed in to secret add. Okay, so we're going for the for the closure approach, I guess. Imagine you have a secret value being read from the environment variables, and imagine being able to materialize that value within the secret add. Uh, function and now you can wrap it inside the definition of a function uh, that takes one argument which is what we want to add so some sort of int and then gets uh, returns Ooh, okay and the secret is okay the secret is okay, okay sorry so the secret has been passed by the user and then we return a function that wraps that secret and that's closing over we say that secret so the whoever invokes that function which can be passed around after it's been created doesn't have to know and will not know the secret itself right and that's the power of uh, closures and how do i close the function do i just go end i don't remember fn param yeah 
yeah so the it looks like the convention is to just go like this and this should return an other function where you pass a number and it adds and that gets added to the secret let's try and run the tests brilliant okay a subtractor is going to be quite similar i guess so this time we have let's see uh, should return a function which takes one argument and subtracts the secret passed into secret subtract from that argument so very very similar and we can start using the shorthand maybe at some point minus secret if I'm not mistaken. Let's try this and then we can move to shorthand syntax or give it a try at least. So I think shorthand syntax would look like ampersand to open the function and then we're returning the integer minus, sorry, the integer which is referenced as, oh, but here, how would that work? Because we'd have to, yeah, I think that's fine first argument minus secret which we're closing over so this would be the shorthand syntax for this let's see nice I have also I also wonder if we can just in put everything on one line and say something like fn int yeah I think we can we can just do semicolon and then end that would also be okay so i think you know some i guess it's a matter of habit but this looks very very simple for someone starting out so maybe let's try and keep that approach multiply will do something similar i guess uh, create a multiplier so a function which takes one argument and multiplies it by the secret okay easy enough we can actually just Going back to what I just said, I'm just using this shorthand and then multiplying by secret, secret divide, probably we can do all in one go. Divide three. Uh, so this is integer division. Oh, this is gonna be fun. So, okay. First thing that comes to mind is we are doing first argument divided by secret, but let's see if this is inter integer division that we're looking for or something else. indeed so the division we used is actually floating point division so we're turning what looks like a float 2.0 uh, whereas actually what's expected is an integer 2 uh, we need to go and figure out what the integer division is looks like in elixir probably a, a double slash or something similar or maybe it's a, me a method that we have to invoke. Integer division, yeah, div and rem, so mod and, and div operations. Um, probably on math. So let's let's look for div. Okay, previous chapter. Okay, there you go. I know that I'm looking for dot div or something. Div. Okay, we don't even need to prepend the module, but I guess it would be some sort of math module. So this would look something like um, math.div first and then second argument, I think. And math is not a module. Okay, so just do. <laughs> We're in the standard library. We don't need to do that. Hmm, okay, we made it. I also wonder if we could just say something like div secret and that would just 
work but let's let's think about it later let's become a bit more acquainted with language before getting into complications secret end let's see this is a um, logical logical operator logic operator end I don't know what that looks like in uh, in uh, elixir. It's probably just end spelled as end, but let's see. <laughs> I'd be surprised, but you never know. Let's see. End doesn't exist. Reserved word. Yes, I know that. Okay, okay. I, I can't invoke it as a function. Just I can do this though, probably. Let's see. Mm, I cannot. Expected a boolean on the left hand side. Okay. Oh, because we're doing a bitwise operation. Okay, then in that case, it's probably something like, because we have two integers and we're doing a bitwise operation between integers. So maybe a double one percent. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to go and look at the documentation, which I don't want to do. Okay, no, we're not there. Um, Should return a function which takes one argument and performs bitwise and operator. Okay, let's just look it up. Bitwise, maybe it's here. Bit. Got very dark all of a sudden. Bitwise operators. Looks here. Hmm. Interesting. I need to use something. And then triple ampersand. Okay. Because I guess if I just go for double, like triple under ampersand, that's not going to be enough. It's going to go like, oh, what is this? Yes, undefined function. But maybe if I use bitwise, maybe that's fine. It is. Okay. What about XOR? Is that also one of these operators? Yes. Bixor. Okay, bitwise XOR. Mm, so in this case, we can go back to our usual shorthand. And as you can see from the um, way we're we are approaching these these exercises, um, it's interesting how. Although the exercises are super simple, we are forced to go and look up documentation and how things are done in the specific language. And that gives us that sense for what it might feel like to program in that language day in and day out. Uh, although again, with uh, uh, being a bit cautious about the statement, but you know, at least we know, we get to see where we end up landing. In this case, the official documentation of Elixir seems to be a great uh, point of reference for um, when we don't know how something works. So going back to the syllabus, because I think that's the best way to also learn something in the, pro in the process, we have a few options. We can talk about floating point numbers, booleans or integers. I know booleans are quite different than uh, in other languages in, um, in uh, Elixir, so why not start there? Um, so Elixir represents true and false values with the Boolean type. Nothing new here. And um, what else? We can evaluate strict Boolean expression using the keywords, um, which is not, which are not keywords; they're actually um, functions, and or and not. So that might remind you of Ruby. Mm. It is also very Ruby-like when writing a function that returns a Boolean value. It is idiomatic to end the function name with a question mark. 
which is not something we can do in all the languages you can definitely do that in Ruby and in um, Elixir as well as far as you can see so that's a good way of indicating to our um, users that um, the function is meant to return a boolean value at a glance okay and we are implementing some rules for pacman let's not get too excited we've done this exercise not for other languages it's just a matter of um, uh, defining uh, using using operators to uh, between between boolean values and figuring out whether pacman should be alive or win the game or lose uh, so we can just go task by task uh, in the editor and start from it ghost which um, basically says whether Pacman is able to eat a ghost or not and that depends on the fact that the power pellet is active and whether or not we are touching a ghost so nothing simpler than this I think if we run the test we're good moving on score uh, we are scoring when we're touching a power pellet or touching a dot one of the two our uh, score will increment whenever one of these two is true and so we're going to use the or operator okay let's see we lose when a power pellet is not active and we are touching a ghost so uh, it's like not power pellet and touching ghost and I think the precedence of operators should be okay here so not power pellet should be evaluated first and then the result will go on to be evaluated in end or maybe not and is a reserve board yes I know that this, does this change anything Oh, something happened here. I sorry. I did I cut something and then didn't paste it back. Yes. Right. And finally, for the win, our win, Pacman wins. Um, we have to have eaten all the dots. Let's see. Pac-Man has eaten all the dots, has a power pellet. Has not lost. Oh, okay, okay. Based on the argument of mine. Okay, so if we have... Okay, in order to win, has eaten all dots must be true. There's no doubt about it. And then we must not be in the process of dying uh, and I think we can maybe just use not lose something like and not lose and then the question mark let's not forget that hope this makes sense we we're just trying to reuse some of the previous functions we've defined yes awesome submitting we can mark this as complete no need to share it again we're very the very first steps in our journey so no need to share our solutions not much to share okay now we are uh, unlocking a series of other exercises which is amazing and other concepts floating point integer uh, list atoms if you have preferences just drop a comment in the in the chat and i'll um, go and take that exercise we have two more to go I'll pick lists just because I'm excited about lists who isn't um, they're usually a bit more fun than uh, uh, primitive types and so yeah let's see where we go right so we define lists with uh, square brackets okay very much like Python and, and Ruby and JavaScript let's see We can see that we can define lists with um, a hybrid set of types. Good to know. 
Elixir implements lists as a linked list, which is not something we're gonna have to worry about in this session, I guess. It means that when we need to access values in the list, we have to traverse the list from the first element going towards the end. And the first element in the list is referred to as head, and the remaining part is a tail. This is important because of um, in Elixir because of how pattern matching is such a big part of the language. And so uh, hopefully we'll get to see a bit of that in this exercise. And this is a notation where the, we can use to express what's the head and what's the tail of the, of the list, which is useful, for example, when you have a list and you want to prepend a single element, you can just go like square bracket, head, the new head, pipe, and then the rest, the tail, which is the list you already have. So prepending elements in Elixir is very, very easy. Um, when we want to prepend elements in list, that's a super easy operation. Which is what we do here, okay. And we need to use the kernel or the list module to actually um, access functions on list, which is going to be something that hopefully we'll do with the first exercise we have language list. Okay, let's start. So task one, define the new function that takes no arguments and returns an empty list. We're sort of, okay. So here we're just returning an empty list literally. So def new should be trivial. Yeah. Second step, define a function to add a language to the list. Okay, hopefully we're gonna prepend that language. As you can see, closure is added first, and then we have Haskell, and Haskell is in front, so we're prepending the element. So that should be very easy based on what we just saw. We can return a list by defining the new head of the list and the existing one. Something like this. Let's see if this works. Okay, removing might take a bit of work. What do we do for removal? Takes one argument, which is the language list, and then it should return the list without the first item. Oh, just the first item. Assume the list will always have at least one item. Okay, so we don't need to do any particular checks um, to ensure that the list is not empty. So we're just assume that the list is not empty and try and drop one element. Uh, I think we can just call tail. And let me try this and then we can maybe try something a bit more fun. Oh, sorry, and I can't just call element call functions on on, uh, <laughs> on objects. That, that's maybe something that you've noticed throughout this uh, set of exercises. We've never done a dot access on a on an object. That's not how um, Elixir works as a functional language. You always have to invoke functions that are attached to modules rather than objects. And so we'll do something like list tail list. Uh, so we'll call the again assuming there's a tail function in the list module the reason let me just check list mm -hmm. how do we get the final part of the oh we could use pattern matching like this uh, but maybe there's also some easy function something like uh, maybe last or huh, that's a bit disappointing but yeah for the time being let's go for because we can actually do even pattern match in the argument which is something I think we can do here which will say we have the head and the tail of the list and we can just return the tail Let's see if this works. Right, it does work. And this is equivalent to actually doing something like 
what was the name of the okay we could do something like um, ht equals list we could say discard the first element and just return t something like this it should also work Uh, yep, yeah, and it does. And we've not really introduced the concept of pattern matching, but it is something I, uh, th that we can leverage here uh, to get where we need to be. So if we do what we just did here, we say, look, we're going to get some sort of head which we don't care about, and then the tail of the list, and we can just return the tail. Then this function will uh, throw an error if we try and provide an empty. Uh, not the function will throw an error, but, but Elixir will complain if we try and call this with an empty list uh, because there's no function matching the empty list type of argument, which is interesting. Moving on, let's see if we can go back to pattern matching later. The final function to return the first item in the list. Okay, uh, we can take the same approach. And again, we're probably assuming that there's um, always an element. And we can just say, look, discard the tail. We don't care about that. Just look at the head and return the head. Nice. And then to define how many languages are in the list, I think we should be able to access some sort of. Um, I don't think we want to traverse the list. We actually want to call some some method on the on the list. Uh, module maybe the size method or something length uh, let's see and it might be that we are we are meant to actually look into some other module that is more general than list but let's just say let's see okay yeah. length is a function on list so we can actually do Something like list dot len. Um, yep. And then list, and they should work. And then finally, functional list. What does this mean? Oh, wait. Language list. Function length is undefined on pr or private. Why is it? Is it though? Do I just go without the module name? That would that would be weird. Yeah, apparently length is already on the on the kernel. Oh yes, we are in the, on the kernel module, so we don't need to prepend that with anything. Um, and there might be more specific functions that we can call for specific implementations of a list that are better suited, more efficient, but in this case, we're just going for kernel. Um, length and finally, the final function to determine if the list includes a functional language. In order to do that, we need to know or to know upfront which languages are considered functional. Um, and I guess that's, that's something that is defined in the spec. And uh, <laughs> so it should return true if Elixir is one of the languages in the list. Okay, that's all it takes. Um, okay, how do we do this? Um, again, maybe looking at the documentation is the first point. First place to start. Is there some sort of find on list? Key find. Hmm, that's not what we want. Because uh, list are 
very general here, as, I, as far as I can see. Child list is not what we care about. There's a bit of everything here. Are we in the right place? Summary, okay. Just want some sort of find. Maybe under the, I don't know, enumerable module or something. Maybe I can check here, find. Yeah, enum find is probably what we're looking for. So, and uh, okay, find, it returns a boolean. I don't know if there's a better match for what we're looking for. So any, any maybe is the better one. Any two, meaning, is there any element that satisfies the predicate in the function? Let's try that. So is there any in the list taking an element or language if you want where line is equal to Bixir? Something like this could work. I'm assuming that equal, that string will work. String equality is um, implemented with a double, double equal sign. Equal. No, not what we're looking for. Yeah, okay, yeah, equal, double equal sign should be the one. Let's try this. Brilliant, submitting. Any recommendation from exorcism? Oh, okay. It's asking us not to use the list mod, the um, enum module, to find stuff. Okay, can we rewrite this? Let's go to the editor. Can we rewrite this in a way where we're not using the enum module? I don't think the list module is um, good enough for us. Let's see. Mm. Oh, let's go to the summary or functions if you want. We have this set of functions. Uh, could maybe fold, but then I don't know if we can exit early. We could key member. Hmm. No, because these are lists of tuples, which is not what we are, what we had here. Replace, start with. Let's try and make it very, very simple, right? We can go through the list. Um, something like, look, if the list event is empty, then return false. If the Delete it as a single element, h, then is h equal elixir, and then if you have, this is a bit of experiment, experimental, but if you have a head and a tail, then we can say h equals elixir or functional list on the tail. I'm checking if I uh, verified the base case, possibly, maybe, let's see. 
No, that's nice. Okay, I'll, I'll just explain this for a moment. Remove the alternative implementation. And again, we're using pattern matching here in uh, Elixir. So we're just defining the function on different lists. Uh, and based on whether the list is empty, has a single element or more than one, the right, the right function will be invoked. And the base case is the one where the list is empty or um, the, there's only one element in the list. So I wonder if I have to have the second case or I can just go for, I can probably remove this. I don't know, I don't know if it works though. I don't know if I need to be explicit about uh, the situation where we have add and tail where tail is empty. Can't seem to comment this. Okay, let's just try and, and run this and see if it fails. Wouldn't be too surprised, but... Oh, it works. Okay, so this is capturing the situation where tail is empty. Okay, good to know. Makes sense, yes, yes, okay, because we've, we've seen in the tutorial that it's actually okay to define a linked list where you have a new head and then an empty list, and that's fine. So in the case where you have a head and then an empty list, that will match this, this case, and then we'll get into the base case where tail is actually empty and will return false. So this is it. Very nice recursive and uh, pattern matching uh, feature used uh, in, in place. So we can submit this solution. Let's see if the review is actually okay now. We can mark as complete. We now want to share our, our nice solution because someone might find it useful, different than what they did. Uh, we have one more to go. One more exercise to go. We have conditions. Oh, right. These are conditional expressions on pattern matching. This is going to be fun. But let's do the floating point and see how that goes. That should be easy enough. Or maybe let's read something about floating points um, before we do. Um, okay. We can see there's automatic type casting to float when there's a floating point number involved in an operation. When do we division the result will always be a float. This is a very very fundamental decision in the in the definition of a language. I was using I was going through the Scala exercises a few days ago and noticed that um, division between integers always returns an integer, so integer division is default for integer um, values, which is very different than what you will find in many other languages. Whereas here, the decision has been made that any division on integer will return a float all the time. And we can trunk to discard whatever comes after the, uh, the, the, the dot in the decimal part. Okay, now we know, now that we know the basics, we can okay so we're talking about daily rates discounts money basically okay um and if i go to task one calculate the daily rate given an hourly rate hopefully just multiplying by by eight hours yeah and so we do hourly rate times uh, eight and it seems like we want to go into float so I've multiplied by 8.0 just to make sure that there's a conversion to float. Mm, okay. And then test. Okay. What, what's the second task? Uh, implement a function to calculate the price after a discount. Okay. That's also something we can do. Uh, so this is the total price. And then we're discounting it by 10%, removing $15 or whatever units. And we go to 135 and again we can do before discount times discount um, and in this case this is discount over 100 
Um, I'm thinking if we need to do the conversion first. So we know that division always returns float. Now, this is an interesting setup where, um, you know, in general, where we're, when we have multiplication and division, the order of the operation doesn't matter. We can divide first or multiply first. But then in this particular setup, we need to think about the fact that we are changing the set in which we are doing the performing the operation. Because if we do the division first, then we're doing int times a float. If we're doing the multiplication first, then we're doing int times an int, which returns an int, and then dividing by 100. That, that should also be fine, because anytime we divide by something, we get into the floating point. So this should be OK. Or not. What is it complaining about? Um, oh, this is the discount. So actually, we should do one. Yeah, uh, so removing the discount from 100%, going 15% down, so 85% of the uh, price before discount. Monthly rate. Okay, let's see the instructions. Implement a function that to calculate the monthly rate and apply a discount. Uh, okay, so monthly rate, so we probably have sort of hours in month. Um, your return monthly rate should be rounded up. So are we multiplying by 30? I'm just assuming that we're multiplying by... Sorry, we're multiplying by what? Say four weeks in a month, so 20 days. We need to be more precise than that. Um, Okay, otherwise we can do we can do something like um, so we have hourly rate, so we can do daily rate, trying to reuse what we've already implemented up there. So daily rate not this times um, say times five, which is number of days in a week, times four point 33, which is numbers of weeks in a month, and then we discount that. Apply discount, and then we can check how far off we are. Discount. Running the tests. We got. 10738.4 we wanted 10912 oh times 22 okay okay the test actually says we wanted time 22 okay it also says we want to round to integer so we have to trunk and again we can't call we can't invoke functions on uh, methods on, on objects here we have to call the trunk function on the uh, floating point. Let's see. Uh, yeah, almost there. There was maybe something about running, rounding up. So rounding up based on what what was the instruction always read the instruction should be rounded up ceiling to the nearest integer so we can just probably take the ceiling seal usually in languages but let's see yeah okay we're good moving on task four calculate the number of work days given a budget hourly rate and discount okay Okay, so we're giving up we're given a budget, an hourly rate, and a certain discount and we need to figure out how many days this person will be able to work 
for us, for example. This is fun, okay. Um, so our budget will be the result of applying a discount to some sort of to some hourly rate, right? And what we need to figure out is the number of days we've multiplied by. So we take we need to invert the apply discount operation. Am I overthinking this? So we have implement a function that takes a budget, hourly rate, and a discount, and calculates how many days of work. Okay. So we have what? And we'll have to do some rounding. So if we do hourly rate times eight, we get how much a day will cost us. And we can maybe just discount that. We can apply a discount to the daily to the daily rate. Right? And this is the this is the um let's say discount daily rate suppressing a few words just to make it a bit simpler for us to write it down okay and then we can do days in budget sorry we can do budget divided by discount daily and see how many days we can work and then there's a matter of um, Precision. So, how many days of work? The return number of days should be rounded down. Okay, so taking the floor, so we're taking the floor of the number we got. And now there's a concern of floor because it wants a float. Why does it want to? I'm a bit puzzled because it wants a float, but we have to go through flooring. So maybe we can just do integer, no, we can't. Yeah, we can do maybe integer division. Let's try that. We can do integer division rather than flooring. But yet, and yet, no, we cannot because budget is not integer, or maybe it is. Discounted daily definitely isn't an integer. Oh, to the first decimal. Rounded number of days should be rounded down to one decimal place. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I missed that. So. So what do we want and how do we hack this together? So if we do budget times discounted daily, that's okay. And then maybe we can check whether floor accepts. Some other argument. Yeah, it does accept two arguments, which is the second one is the precision range, which is what we were hoping for. So we're going to floor to one decimal digit. Let's see if that's what we want. I'm just guessing that this is how the function works. And this is part of the float module, probably. Maybe. Yes, awesome. Okay, submitting. Passing, no comments from Exorcism, so we can mark this as complete. Yeah, we can share the solution. 
we can show more concepts, but also we can celebrate because we have now one, two, three, four, five, actually six already, six exercises beyond the hello world, maybe even more. Oh, it might be that a single exercise is in two categories at the same time, yeah? And that's why I'm seeing, so I don't, yeah, exactly, secret is in two categories at the same time, but I think we now reach the point where we have five exercises plus the yellow word completed as we do which means that according to the criteria for the 12 in 23 we are now done with crystal so we've learned enough we can go and become professional elixir engineers now um but yeah uh, i think i'm gonna stop here thanks for um watching through hopefully you learned as much as i did uh during the session um yeah, I'm very happy we got to browse the documentation, the Elixir documentation a bit, and um, play around with, with some concepts uh, like pattern matching, for example. Oh, yeah, and I, yeah, I really recommend that you get at least as far as lists and um, cons so that we can get a bit of a feel for, for what makes the language special, really. Um, yeah, and let me know how you found this. Uh, you find me on, on Twitter or uh, all those um, GitHub, whatever, as Eldarati, so you can always get in touch. Feel free to send me a message if you enjoyed this, and I'll try and cross post this to YouTube. I haven't done that in a while, but if you found this valuable, I can go on with some more Elixir or go back to Crystal or try something else. I think if I had to just, you know, think about the next seven languages. Um, that I'm gonna look into. I think I wanted to probably spend a bit of time on uh, maybe do the Go exercises because this one seems to be one of the uh, tracks that are very well done and thought of with 34 concepts and 136 exercises. I'm probably gonna skip ASCO and Java. I might go into JavaScript if we really need that extra language. Kotlin might be fun. It doesn't seem like there's much of a tutorial going on, but it might be fun. And um, I wonder what happened to PureScript. I remember, I don't know if the language ever got the traction it deserved, but it might be fun to play around with that a bit. And I saw another one that seemed interesting. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it, uh, but Ren. Ren I don't remember hearing of and uh, it seemed interesting from the description. Uh, TypeScript I think we'll do eventually and um, and Rust for sure, yeah. Uh, Rust seems, seems good too. I'm surprised Swift has so many concepts uh, and I don't know how much it's targeting the mobile development, maybe not at all because I guess it's a standalone language as well. So this might be fun as well. It's probably a lot of uh, concepts that we're already familiar with. Okay, once again, thanks for watching. Mm, I'll see you uh, in a few days. Uh, do we want to exit? We want to stop streaming, yeah? Yeah, let's stop streaming.